Hi, this is Guy Wallace with another in my series, Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development. The series is subtitled The Insomnia Solution, but not for my insomnia, but for yours. Just, just kidding. Um, in this episode, we're going to talk about knowledge and skill categories and the knowledge and skill matrix. Uh, I have 17 different categories of enabling knowledge and skills so that I can systematically tease out based on the performance model and the details about outputs and tasks and gaps, we can systematically derive these enabling knowledge and skills per area of performance. Now we could go more detail to every output and task set, but that gets a little bit too much too granular and I've not found that that was necessary. But there have been clients who have asked us to do that and we've tied that in at a much uh, more detailed level um, and I'm not sure what utility there was that in that for them but uh, for my purposes of designing curriculum architectures or designing instruction uh, including job aids besides training um, it, it hasn't been necessary to tie enabling knowledge and skills back down anything lower than um, the area of performance um, so the categories are not all used typically in any particular one project. So, and these categories are, uh, I start off with number one, company policies, procedures, practices, and guidelines. These are the rules and, and uh, prescribed to performers internally. So these are the internal rules. The second category of knowledge and skills are the laws, regulation, codes, agreements, and contracts. So these are the externally imposed rules. Now what I've found over the years is that uh, in highly regulated industries, highly regulated companies, is that we don't need to use both categories. We don't need, need to use category number two and what are the laws, the regulations, and codes because in a highly regulated company, they're all reflected in the policies and procedures of category one. So we can skip category two. If the client is not highly regulated, then I'm gonna go after both, what are all your policies and procedures as they relate to the first part of the job, the second part of the job, the third part of the job, but I'm gonna do the same thing with the laws regulations and codes that are expo uh, imposed externally because the policies and procedures may in fact not reflect those and that needs to be part of good instruction helping people learn how to perform uh, to the s satisfaction of all the stakeholders. The third category is industry standards. Now sometimes it's important for the people doing the performance to adhere to industry standards and sometimes they want to definitely not adhere to the old standards they want to break free of the standards and do something new or there may not be any industry standards at all in the jobs that you're looking at so that's a category that you may or may not use the next one is internal organizations and resources and like the fifth category external organizations and resources so what are the various organizational entities inside and outside the company that you might be called, you might need to call upon to get your work done. And same thing with resources. So there's other organizations and there's corporate libraries and there's books and there's websites and there's all these things internally and externally available to help people do their jobs. So that's what we're trying to capture there. I may also need to know about marketplace knowledge. What's going on in the marketplace? Who's in the marketplace? What are the customers? What are the various customer segments? What are the various vendors and suppliers? In the, uh, are they value added resellers? Are they uh, original equipment manufacturers? What kind of competitors are we competing with and what do they look like out there in the sales channel, in the marketing channels um, that the company is operating in? So sometimes people have a need to understand the marketplace. Um, that would include your competitive products and services as well. Now the next category, seven, is our own products and services. So what products and services does our company render to the marketplace? And then I can take that in combination with my knowledge of the marketplace in general and the competitors out there and the, and the buyers out there and what the competitive products and services are. Now I focus in on my own products and services and understand them to a greater extent and understand them vis-a-vis -vis 
the competitive products out there. It's one thing for me to know that there's a competitive product. There's another thing for me to know what our version of that competitive product is. But I need to understand what are the feature differences, the advantage differences perhaps, the benefit differences perhaps for my potential customers for my products and services. I may need to know that. Category 8 is process knowledge. So what are the processes that we've named and numbered around here? Or are there informal processes that we've named but, but we don't really have them pinned down too tightly? So what are they? People need to know. What are the records, reports, documents, and forms? Category number 9. Category 10, materials and supplies. So as people are doing their various parts of their job, what are the materials and supplies that are consumed in that process? And what do they really need to know about them? Uh, what are the differences, the distinctions, the decisions that have been made around all of those? Category 11, tools, equipment, machinery. Same thing. Where are those things used? Where do I use the, uh, the flat iron? Uh, number 12, computer systems, software, and hardware. So what are all the computer things, whether it's the hardware or some program, and where are they used in the job? Uh, some of these might be used throughout in every aspect of the job and others not so much. You might use a word processing program and a PowerPoint slide kind of a program in every part of your job. That's an enabling knowledge and skill to be able to use those things within the context of your authentic performance, your areas of performance. Category 11 is personal and interpersonal skills. So when we're dealing with people, what are those interpersonal skills that we need to exhibit? Um, and what are some of the just personal development things where I'm not de necessarily dealing with people, but I may have to have time management skills, planning my own time, planning my calendar, etc. And so, you know, where is that really critical? Um, category 14 is management and supervisory skills. Now, not every one of our projects is about managers and supervisors, so that's a category that isn't used unless, of course, we're studying managers and supervisors, and then that's a knowledge and skill category that's unique to them. Category 15 is business knowledge and skills. So what do you need, you know, if you were to get an MBA, what are the things that you learn in an MBA and, you know, what of that do you need to know when you're doing the various parts of our job? The 16th category is professional technical knowledge and skills and the 17th category is functional specific knowledge and skills. I used to refer to these as the cow catcher, the thing on the front of a locomotive uh, train that would move the cows off the track uh, as the train approached. Uh, these are catch-alls, if you will. And so if there is something that because you're in sales, that you're in the sales profession and there are things that are unique to what you're doing. If you were an engineer working in the sales function, you'd bring your engineering skills to that professional category, 16, 17, functional specific knowledge and skills where well, you're an engineer in the sales department so you'd need to understand the sales functional things but you're bringing in your engineering knowledge and skills to participate in the sales processes so there's a time when i need to have deeper professional my own profession and maybe i'm in my home room in the engineering department or maybe i'm an engineer that's been loaned out to some other department and I've got to learn their stuff as well. And so that's what those final categories are to catch all that. Um, well, when we're eliciting this, we're looking at the performance model data um, and we're trying to capture uh, these knowledge and skills per area performance. And so as you look at the knowledge and skill matrix, the column on the far left is the knowledge and skill items themselves. This is what we list. But at the top it says category. So if we're looking at internal uh, organizations and resources, then we're going to be listing knowledge and skill items that have to do with internal organizations and resources. The corporate library, the corporate intranet, um, the uh, help desk, um, the HR, you know, there could be a lot of these uh, different uh, um, knowledge and skill items. But we would link them to the area of performance where they enable. So if I need to understand that knowledge and skill item, it's because it enables me to do one of the performance. And we've got columns A through G here, so seven different areas of performance. There could be more, there could be less. Uh, this is just a standard uh, uh, blank form, if you will. 
And once I've understood all the knowledge and skills of that category, then I can really tag this in the next column, select or train, S or T. Do we select people that already have this knowledge and skill? I mean, if we were talking about AC, DC, electrical theory, and we're hiring engineers, we can assume that we're going to be selecting people who have that. And that takes it off of the list for the training organization to potentially have to st uh, step up to that and deal with that content and provide that kind of content. Of course, it may be low-hanging fruit content that doesn't uh, need or isn't worthy of uh, formal treatment, so we might leave it to informal learning. But so this is where, that column is where we identify for all the knowledge and skill items that we found, which ones are we selecting for, and no one ever gets the job if they don't have it. And all the rest of them have a training implication or a potential training implication. The next thing is for each of these knowledge and skill items, how critical is that knowledge and skill item to my ability to be a master performer? That's how I phrase that question. High, medium, or low, or zero is the answer. Uh, how difficult is it to learn high, medium, or low? Now, high, medium, and low, these are all relative to everything else we've captured, not high, medium, and low to walking on the sun or something impossible, but within the context of this work, what are the relatively easier or the relatively more difficult aspects of this performance? And that's what we're trying to capture. The next column, volatility. So how volatile is this content on that knowledge and skill item? Is that highly volatile, medium, or low, or zero? Um, and we want to know that because as we're informing the design decisions, we need to understand the risks inherent in putting volatile content in with non-volatile content. And our maintenance costs are going to go up. The more we put and package into content that's volatile, the more that part is going to need to be changed. And um, we can make that change and uh, I'll go from there. The final column is the depth of coverage. So if we were going to cover this knowledge and skill item, if we were going to cover it, if we're not going to leave it to informal learning, would we cover to a level of a general awareness? Would we make people generally aware about that knowledge and skill item? Or would we go deeper, deeper knowledge level? And or would we take it all the way to a skill? Now, all knowledge and skills end up in performance, so ultimately they impact a skill. But if that knowledge and skill item itself, if we were to talk about the corporate library, is there a skill level that we would train somebody on? No, no. We just need to make them generally aware that we have a corporate library. It's got a lot of stuff in it. We're not going to go through the whole list now because you're not going to memorize it. And so just we just need to make you aware that we have a corporate library and you should take advantage of it when you're doing this part of your job and this other part of your job and this other part of your job. Um, perhaps it doesn't apply to all the rest of your job. So we're trying to point that out. But if we were going to say we're going to, you're going to use a word processing program here, well, we're going to take that to a skill level. And then once you have the skill of word processing, you can use that skill in the tasks to produce the outputs of value in your areas of performance. Anyway, so that's the knowledge and skill categories, 17 of them. And we capture all of this data on the knowledge and skill matrices. Uh, and again, we're deriving these knowledge and skills by taking a close look incrementally at the performance requirements as captured in the performance models that we talked about in an earlier video. Anyway, that's it for this episode in Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development with your host, me, Guy Wallace. This is also known as the Insomnia Solution, but not for my insomnia, but for yours. Just kidding. Anyway. Good luck. Cheers.